Thank you for downloading this episode of Case Notes. Case Notes was recorded at the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh as part of the Edinburgh History of Medicine seminar series. You can get news of our latest events if you follow us on Twitter at RCP Heritage. Did food allergy exist before the term allergy was coined by Clemens von Perquet in 1906? To some medical historians, there's nothing wrong with this question. Diseases, from this perspective, are biological entities that may, in some circumstances, evolve over time, but essentially retain the same characteristics. The insightful historian, therefore, should be able to match up, following a careful examination of the available evidence, the historical descriptions of an individual's symptoms with a modern disease. Historical figures have often been subject to such retrospective diagnoses, with the madness of King George III and investigations into what killed Prince, uh, Prince Albert, uh, Queen Victoria's husband, just being two of, the, two of many well-known examples. Now, to a certain extent, there's absolutely nothing wrong with performing retrospective diagnoses. Archaeological investigations into what people suffered and died from in previous eras, for example, can provide enormous insights into our understandings of the past. The inevitable debates that rage about what killed Alexander the Great or what caused Charles Darwin's gastrointestinal problems also raise important issues about how to weigh different uh, bits of historical evidence. But, as many have argued, applying modern medical categories to historical descriptions of disease can also be misleading, not least because doing so overlooks that disease is both a social and a biological phenomenon. As societies change, so do their conceptualizations of disease. Syphilis transformed from a carnal scourge, the great pox, or the French, Spanish, Italian, Christian plague, depending on your perspective, which was seen as a foreign threat and best treated with penance, to a bacterial infection best treated with penicillin. In contrast, consumption in the USA devolved from a romantic, fashionable disease seen to afflict the genteel during the mid-19th century to tuberculosis decades later, a disease associated with working-class immigrants. Along with changes in how diseases are understood by physicians in the broader community come profound changes in how sufferers experience the disease, not only in terms of treatment and or diagnosis and treatment, but also socially and psychologically. Therefore, an investigator might be able to claim that Charles Darwin's gastrointestinal problems were caused by Crohn's disease, a common 20th century condition, but such a diagnosis, however well defended, does little to tell us about how Darwin and his family dealt, or under, dealt with or understood his intestinal troubles, let alone provide any insight into how stomach pain was interpreted by physicians during the 19th century. The debates over retrospective diagnoses, therefore, become much sound and fury signifying nothing. So, what bearing does the retrospe retrospective uh, diagnosis have on the prehistory of food allergy, the period before the coining of the term allergy in 1906? Similar problems emerge. First and foremost are difficulties related to the changing definitions and use of the term allergy, debates which have been present ever since von Perquet coined the term. Von Perquet's definition of allergy as quote, any form of altered biological reactivity encompassed not only dysfunctional immune reactions, for instance, when an individual breaks into hives after consuming strawberries, but also normal immune function, such as the building of antibodies after the exposure of a virus, uh, exposure to a virus. Making matters more complicated is, is the fact that von Perke's term allergy did not become the first preferred term for such reactions until the 1920s. Before then, physicians tend to use Charles Richet's term anaphylaxis, which the French physiologist coined in 1902. 
to describe cases in which repeated exposure to foreign proteins caused an increase rather than a decrease in sensitivity. The opposite of myth mithritidism, where exposure to small amounts of snake venom can actually cause uh, uh, immunity over time. Today, however, anaphylaxis is only used to describe certain types of allergic responses, su such as the sudden, intense, and often life-threatening reactions to bee stings, medications, latex, and of course, peanuts and other foods. Allergy has also been used uh, liberally in common speech to apply to a pronounced distaste for something rather than a genuine allergic reaction, for example, as uh, a recent episode of uh, New Tricks, getting an insight into my television viewing, um, one of the detectives says I'm allergic to poetry. Basketball players can be allergic to the paint, meaning that they prefer to shoot the ball from outside rather than muscling in for a layup. Loose use of the word allergic similar, similarly reveals hidden problems about the term itself, which have caused debates and divisions within the allergy community throughout the 20th century. While most conservative allergists have restricted the definition of allergy to instances of dysfunctional immune responses to foreign proteins, such as those found in food, <clears throat> others have applied the term more broadly, encompassing reactions uh, that don't seem to involve the immune system and might best be described as intolerances. So, when it comes to retrospective diagnosis of food allergy, not only has the definition of allergy long been contentious, but it also has been fluid in both medical and popular contexts, and will likely remain so. Now, that doesn't mean that there's no point to investigating how physicians and patients explained strange reactions to food in the centuries before allergy was coined. On the contrary, Doing so can be extremely useful, both as a historical enterprise in itself, but also in terms of setting the stage for the debates that would emerge in the 20th century. And what follows, I don't really engage in retrospective diagnosis so much as seek to explore the prehistory of food allergy, which I think is quite a different task. Instead of attempting to prove that reports of bizarre food reactions were in fact what we would now call food allergy, I hope to show that such responses were understood prior to the emergence of allergy as a medical, as me, I, I hope to show how, sorry, such responses were understood prior to the emergence of allergy as a medical and cultural phenomenon. I hope to demonstrate that while unusual reactions to food may not have dominated medical discussions prior to the 20th century, they've long been recognized and often have triggered debates, many of which have not been resolved. <clears throat> so as many of you will probably be aware, dietary advice was central to many ancient medical philosophies and not least the humoral medicine of Hippocrates and Galen. Diet could play a pivotal role in balancing the four humors. Although there were some general rules uh, in terms of the humoral tendencies of particular people, while, while men tended to be hot and dry, women were usually cold and wet, and children were warm and wet, each individual had their own specific humoral constitution meaning that a dietary regimen that was healthy for one person might not be necessarily healthy for another. The individual, individualized nature of humoralism would seem to suggest that bizarre idiosyncratic reactions to foods would not be too difficult to incorporate into the overreaching medical philosophy. Suitably, one of the first known discussions of how foods could have profoundly dissimilar effects on different people is associated with Hippocrates and the effects of cheese. So, as Hippocrates says, cheese does not harm all men alike. Some can eat their fill of it without the slightest hurt, nay, those it agrees with are wonderfully strengthened thereby. Others come off badly. Although Hippocrates did not specify what it actually meant to come off badly, he did hypothesize about the possible mechanism behind such reactions. Quote, so the constitution of these men differ, and the differences lie in the constituent of the body which is hostile to cheese and is roused and stirred to action under its influence. 
those in whom a humor of such a kind is present in greater quantity and with greater control over the body naturally suffer more severely. But if cheese were bad for the human constitution without exception, it would have hurt all. Hippocrates' description of the quote, constituent of the body which is roused and stirred to action is particularly evocative of what we might today describe an overactive immune system. Stating that the humor may be present in varying quantities also suggests that the reaction portrayed by Hippocrates is not an either-or phenomenon, but rather one that exists on a continuum, which fits in neatly with other aspects of Hippocratic medicine that emphasize the importance of balancing humors through a regimen that not only includes diet, but also exercise, rest, bathing, and emetics. The other famous classical reference to bizarre food reactions may not uh, become quite so evocative of allergy upon close examination, but no nonetheless has become something of the food allergist aphorism. The saying, one man's food is another man's poison, uh, is attributed to Lucretius. <clears throat> a Roman poet, philosopher, and Epicurean, and is found, found in the fourth book of his didactic poem, De Rerum Natura, or the, On the Nature of Things. Although the adage has been, uh, although the adage has been adopted by allergists, however, the context of the quotation indicates that Lucretius was not describing the same type of idiosyncratic somatic reactions as Hippocrates, but rather how individuals, and more to the point, different animals, may differ markedly with respect not only to taste, but also to the digestibility of certain foods. And now why different creatures need a different kind of food, I will explain. And why what seems to one most sweet seems to another evil, noisome, bad. The difference is very great. That which is food to one to others proves a biting, poisonous curse. There is a snake, you know, which only touched with human spit must straightway die, itself devour itself. The two, the hell bore, to men a biting, poisonous curse, makes goats and quails grow fat. In this translation, Lucretius ap appears to be discussing the differences between species, rather than the differences between individual humans. That which is food to one to other proves a biting poisonous curse, given the context of why different creatures need a different kind of food, does not seem to emphasize humans at all. Other translations, however, have translated the same passage as one man's meat is not another's. And what is bitter and un unpalatable to one may strike another as delicious which does suggest that Lucretius was thinking about how humans differ significantly when it comes to taste. While the former translation does not lend itself particularly well to the conceptualizations of idiosyncrasy and allergy that would follow, the latter certainly does, indicating not only the complexities of classical translation, but also how a phrase uttered in one context and in one language can be adopted for quite different purposes in another. In this way, Lucretius's aphorism mirrors the ways in which the term allergy itself would be reshaped and adapted during the 20th century. As for other classical references, Galen mentions in On the Properties of Foodstuffs how foods that were easily digestible by some people could be quite unpalatable for others. For instance, some digested beef more easily than rockfish a phenomenon which Galen attributed to a, quote, constitutional peculiarity. The consumption of honey and lentils could also trigger disparate symptoms depending on an individual's constitutional peculiarity. There are other anecdotes described by Galen that bear some similarity to food allergy as well. One such case involved the baby who was covered with sores after drinking the breast milk of a wet nurse who, quote, lived on a diet of wild vegetables from the countryside for it was springtime and a food shortage was pressing. Although the sores bring to mind eczema, which has been associated with milk allergy, Galen's assertion was that the wet nurse and other people in the same area also suffered from similar sores, suggesting 
that the problem lay not with the milk itself, but with the vegetables. Indeed, strange dermatological reactions to other seasonal fruits and vegetables, which are eaten in quantity for a short period of time, such as strawberries and asparagus, have been cited by other physicians. Nevertheless, a number of allergists and others have claimed that this is an instant of Gal Galen describing milk allergy. Despite the lack of clarity with respect to Galen and bizarre reactions to milk, the physician's opinions about eating fresh fruit hinted a more personal connection between food and its effects on health. In a discussion of how Galen gleaned insights about food and health during his widespread travels, the eminent classicist Vivian Nutton contemplates about whether the physician's, quote, notorious rejection of fresh fruit, which he believes produces bad humors, influenced his theories about the nutritiousness of various foods. In other words, quote, how far is Galen generalizing from his own experiences to refute or reject the ideas of others, or to set up his own guidelines for proper diet? This is a major problem, if not the major one. For his part, Nutton discounts the likelihood that an allergy was at the heart of Galen's aversion to fruit. Instead, he contends that the fruit's ill effects on Galen were more psychosomatic and linked to Galen's relationship with his father, who was, quote, strongly against fresh fruit. When Galen broke his father's taboo as a young man, eating, quote, a large quantity of autumnal fresh fruits, the result was an acute illness cured only by venesection. The illness returned when his father died and continued during his eight-year period away uh, from home for study. It only disappeared when Galen gave up fruit altogether, save for small amounts of figs and grapes, and returned home to Pergamon to resume his familial duties, suggesting a relationship between the illness and Galen's guilt about disobeying his father and leaving home. Whatever the explanation, Galen's attitude towards fresh fruit highlights not only that ancient physicians believed strongly in the connection between food and health, but also the tendency of tendency of physicians to generalize about diet based on their own experiences. And certainly Nutton's contention that the uh, reaction was actually psychosomatic is, is also uh, interesting in that for much of the mid-20th century, psychosomatic theories of allergy abounded. So moving on to the early modern period. After the classical period, it's fairly difficult to find many examples of strange reactions to food in medical writing or literature until nearly the 19th century. To a degree, this lacuna is understandable. Western medical thought until at least the 16th century was dominated by humoralism, which allowed for a considerable degree of variation with respect to individuals and their constitutions. As such, an, indiv an individual's aversion to a particular food might be thought necessary to re redress a humoral imbalance, rather than being indicative of anything peculiar. It is also likely that many untoward reactions to food were due to food poisoning, for example, exposure to salmonella and E. coli, or adulteration, for instance, mixing chalk into flour to stretch it out, both of which continue to be causes of ill health. Moreover, the diets of all but the wealthy were relatively restricted compared to today, both in terms of variety and, of course, volume, meaning that the likelihood of an adverse reaction to a particular food was considerably less. Finally, given the number of endemic infectious diseases, Combined with widespread malnutrition, vitamin deficiency, and comparatively poor living conditions, it's probable that strange reactions to food were not at the top of many physicians' list of concerns. That said, it is possible to find instances where bizarre reactions to food are described by physicians, usually using the term idiosyncrasy, a term that could apply to any number of singular or unusual predispositions or characteristics. In the, 1970, in the 1743 Medical Dictionary, written by the English physician Robert James, for example, idiosyncrasy was defined as, defined as follows. Every individual has a state of health peculiar to his, himself, and as different bodies seem to vary from each other, both with respect to the solids and fluids, though each may at the same time be in sound condition, this peculiarity of constitutions by which they differ from other sound bodies is called idiosyncrasy. James proceeded to warn that the, warn that the phenomenon 
is so remarkable and so common that unless regard be had to it, the life of the patient may be endangered, adding that other drugs and plasters can trigger such reactions in susceptible individuals. Now, as far as idiosyncrasies to foods are concerned, the only one James mentioned involves melons. The sweet fresh flesh of melons was described as delicious by James, yet it could also cause fevers and grips due to their cold and humid quality and tendency to putrefy in the stomach. It's possible, James added, that some symptoms associated with eating melons were due to idiosyncrasy rather than their humoral properties being cold and wet. One of James's contemporaries, a Scottish physician, William Cullen, who defined idiosyncrasy as a, peculi a peculiarity of temperament in a particular part of the system, similarly associated the phenomenon with unintended reactions to medicine, yet also mentioned instances of idiosyncrasies to food. In Lectures on the Materia Medica, 1773, Cullen defined idiosyncrasy as what has explained how... Uh, explaining how certain individuals had idiosyncrasies to honey, egg, and crab. In the case of even, quote, a small bit of egg, crab, egg or crab, the reactions were described as spasmodic symptoms, which symptoms can only be explained from idiosyncrasy. In the century that followed, idiosyncrasy was increasingly associated with diet, both in the medical and popular literature. Writing in 1884, the London-based emeritus professor of surgery, John Hutchinson, described idiosyncrasy as peculiarity of constitutions in some one particular feature developed to, such, to a height which is, at first sight, seems inexplicable and possibly almost absurd. It is individuality run mad. Idiosyncrasies, according to Hutchinson, were present at birth and tended not to undergo modification with age. He explained how surgeons, such as himself, were accustomed to idiosyncrasies to particular drugs, such as, such as quinine, bro bromides, or iodides, but felt obliged as well to discuss diet idiosyncrasy, since it was common for patients to inquire about the phenomenon. Eggs were of particular interest to Hutchinson. Ever since... <clears throat> He came across a, a patient who had a very uh, remarkable idiosyncrasy tags. Uh, what he describes is several patients consulted me within a short period who described a liability to attacks of violent vomiting or a sense of sinking and abdominal distress, which were to them inexplicable. In more than one of these, the reason of my being consulted was that, the, was that the attacks were attended by temporary defect in sight. In one instance, the patient was an artist who declared that, the frequently, that frequently he was un, quite unable for several hours at a time to see to paint. It always affected both eyes and was always attended by a sense of heat at the stomach and abdominal discomfort. I found that these attacks yearly, usually occurred within an hour or two of breakfast. And on entering into detail, I became convinced that they were due to eating eggs. Due to e eating eggs. On telling my patient my conclusion, he replied at once that he had always suspected it. Yet being quite very fond of eggs, he had indulged in one once in a month or so. He was quite cured by abstinence. Now, although Hutchinson emphasized the prevalence of egg idiosyncrasies, he also stressed that the variety of idiosyncrasies was, quote, innumerable, and hinted that most patients would exhibit such a peculiarity. Hutchinson's acceptance of individual differences, along with his apparent willingness to trust his patients' accounts of their symptoms, marks so one side of a dichotomy that would characterize how physicians prior to the 20th century viewed the relationship between food and mysterious symptoms, and indeed how 20th century allergists would view food allergy. Specifically, while some physicians put their faith in general principles or theories that explain most clinical phenomena, others, including Hutchinson, were eager to explore cases such as those involving dietary idiosyncrasy in which the rules did not seem to apply. In the discussion of migraine headaches, asthma and skin conditions that follows, the tension between the general rules 
and idiosyncrasy with respect to diet loomed large. So, uh, sick headache or, or migraine. In a paper delivered to the Royal Society of Physicians of London in 1778, John Fothergill, a physician, botanist, and Quaker preacher, presented his theories about sick headache or migraine, headaches that were associated with nausea, vomiting, and visual disturbances. disturbances. Fothergill, no stranger to such headaches himself, stated that they were a common complaint and emphasized that while sedentary individuals were more likely to suffer from them, Diet was the primary cause. He proceeded to explain that there, there are some things which, in very small quantities, seldom fail to produce the sick headache in some constitutions. Such are a larger proportion than usual of melted butter, fat meats, and spices, especially common black pepper. Meat pies often contain all these things united and are a fertile cause of this complaint, as anything I know. So are rich baked puddings and everything of a similar nature. A little error in these things will seldom fail to be attended with much suffering in many constitutions. Most kinds of malt liquor taken too liberally seldom fail to have this effect in particular constitutions, perhaps from the quantity of hops, for most bitters seem to seem rather to increase than lessen the complaint. Although emetics, cathartics, and laxatives, along with mineral waters, could help alleviate <clears throat> Such headaches, Father Gill warned that, quote, we are perhaps too ready in chronic cases, cases where digestion is concerned to confide in the materia medica and judge it sufficient to select and enjoin such articles in our prescriptions as are known use in such cases. But unless the whole plan of diet, both in kind and quantity, are made to conspire with medical prescription, the benefits arising from this are hourly annihilated by neglect or indulgence. Similarly to many of his contemporaries, Father Gill added that eating slowly rather than devouring one's food, as well as resisting the urge to eat too much, would not only help to manage chronic uh, and anomalous diseases, but also preserve health more generally. Now, on the one hand, Father Gill's advice about sick, sick headache amounted simply to general dietary guidance that would be applicable to anyone. Dietary advice was proffered in most medical textbooks and primers in which certain foods were damned and others were praised. Eminent physicians such as George Chain, writing in his seminal text on nervous disorders, The English Malady, argued not only that diet was central to health, but also contended, as with Fothergill, that the quality and quantity of foods that one ate should match one's lifestyle. While robust, active individuals should not eat a thin, poor, cool, low diet, a poor, thin, low, valetudinary creature should not eat a gross, full, high diet. As Father Gill condemned certain foods, such as melted butter, others heap praise or scorn on other articles of diet. The 19th century surgeon Edward Jukes, writing about intestinal complaints, described turnips as, quote, a useless, harmless laxative, affording but little nutrition, and peas as extremely indigestible and to be avoided by delicate stomachs. On the other hand, Father Gill's discussion of the idiosyncratic aspects of sick headache brings to mind many of the debates that would envelop food allergy over a century later. First, the physician's admission that he himself suffered from such symptoms provides another example of a clinician who studied a condition to which he suffered. Second, although Father Gill warned that certain dietary habits, particularly overeating and eating too quickly, contributed to sick headache, he also emphasized the importance of each person's constitution. In other words, there was something inherent in the makeup of certain individuals that made them incapable of consuming rich foods without suffering dire consequences. Inactive individuals might be more disposed to such reactions than others, but the heart of the condition was a constitutional difference for which changes in diet rather than the prescription of medicine were necessary. Father Gill's assertion that errors of diet were largely responsible for migraine headaches would influence not only later physicians who wrote about the condition, but also popular notions of migraine. In a book on what he called Megrim, Edward Living, 
uh, who served as registrar of the Royal College of Physicians, explained how the public was convinced that bilious food was responsible for so-called bilious headaches. So deeply rooted with the general public is the notion that most headaches of this class are produced by this cause, and especially by the irritation which is, which is assumed to rise from the presence of bile, either excessive in quantity or bad in quality, strengthened as this con conviction is in the minds of many sufferers by the retching and consequent discharge of bile which often attends the attacks, that the greatest caution is necessary in accepting statements which such persons make on this subject and especially the loose and conventional expressions that they constantly em employ in speaking of their complaints. Although, oh, sorry. Um, <clears throat> one of Living's patients, for instance, believed that bilious food, such as butter, caused her migraine. After, inve after investigating, however, Living argued that the headaches were much, likely, much more likely to be hereditary since the patient's sister also suffered from them and also hinted that the patient's neuroses might also be partly responsible, something that other physicians, including the Swiss Samuel Auguste Tiso, also suggested. Dietary explanations <clears throat> were so common that Living reported being surprised when one of his patients, quote, was never able to trace an attack to any indiscretion in diet or to any particular type of food. Although he agreed that diet could play a role in Megram, as Father Gill and other physicians who themselves suffered from Megram suggested, it was not always the explanation. And Living, Living gently chastised Father Gill for focusing so much on dietary explanations. While wine, especially of the sacramental variety, and burnt pastry had unfailingly triggered Megram in one physician known to Living for 30 years, Quote, probably a majority who, notwithstanding the force of long tradition, unhesitatingly deny the influence for the, be for the better or worse of any dietary. In the case of migraine, as with other intractable conditions, physicians struggled to reconcile the opinions expressed both by their patients and the public more generally that blamed errors in diet for the suffering with a theoretical understanding of the underlying mechanism for such symptoms. Moving on to asthma. Other chronic debilitating conditions which physicians had difficulty explaining and treating successfully were also commonly attributed to dietary factors. Diet, as the historian Mark Jackson has outlined, has long been thought to be an important in controlling asthma featuring in the theories of writers ranging from the medieval Jewish scholar Maimonides to the English physician John Floyer, who suffered from the condition himself. Floyer, who, like Maimonides, saw asthma in terms of humoral imbalance, declared that no distemper requires more orderly diet than asthma. And in addition, in addition to discouraging the consumption of alcohol, recommended that asthma, asthmatics should avoid all that produces a viscid chyle, thickens the humors, creates phlegm and wind, and stops the breathing, such as that of pudding crust and most meal meats, of rice, peas, beans, and milk meats, as cream, cheese, etc., and among flesh meats as fish, eggs, young creatures, young pigs, and the extremity of animals and jelly broths, oysters, etc., The humoral conceptualizations of asthma presented by Maimonides and Floyer may have become less influential in the decades that followed, but many physicians continued to associate particular foods with the onset of asthma attacks. Authors of texts on asthma, including John Miller, Thomas Withers, and Robert Bree, all indicated that diet played a role in the condition. Asthma was certainly blamed on other factors, including changes in the weather, violent exercise, dust, the fumes of metals and minerals, constipation, anxiety, fatigue, mental excitement, and other things, uh, <clears throat> but diet was mentioned as well. The peculiar nature of asthma meant that what gives immediate and full relief to one person totally fails in another. 
Given that this was the case and the history of blaming errors in diet for asthma, it's not surprising that dietary explanations continued to be cited in medical journals, textbooks, domestic medical manuals, and in the writing of arguably the most important authority on asthma during the 19th century, Henry Hyde Salter. Salter was a London physician and at 33 years of age, the youngest fellow to be elected to both the Royal College of Physicians and the Royal Society. He was also, as many physicians who studied asthma were, asthmatic. Salter highlighted the ob obduracy of asthma, stating that its etiology was the most difficult aspect of the condition for physicians to explain. He emphasized that the causes of asthma were twofold, consisting of both the immediate trigger of an asthma attack and the predisposing tendency to have such spasms, which tended to be hereditary. In the former category, Salter listed uh, four triggers. One, irritants admitted into the air passage in respiration. So dust particles and, and, and things like that. Two, Alimentary irritants, so errors in diet. Three, sources of remote nervous irritation. And four, psychical irritants. Now, despite this rather straightforward list, the causes of individual cases of asthma were stub stubbornly unique. There are probably no two cases alike in the list of things that will bring on an attack. What will be certain to do so in one case will be innocuous in another, and what will be fatal in the other will be innocent in the one. So that no one thing can be declared an inevitable provocative of asthma, but each case is constant, and the excitants of the spasm constitute a part of the individuality and form an unchanging portion of the clinical history of each case. And nothing, I think, does asthma show its caprice more than in the choice of its exciting causes. Every case almost furnishes something new and curious in this respect. The mere enumeration of the whole list would be portentously long. Underlying all such individual triggers, however, was nothing more def def definite than, quote, an asthmatic tendency, the asthmatic idiosyncrasy with which the individual was born. Although Salter believed that respiratory irritants, ranging from animal hairs and pollen to smoke and dust, were the most common triggers, dietary factors were, quote, a very fruitful source of asthma. There was an intimate connection, according to Salter, between the stomach and the lungs, which was at the heart of the asthma paroxysm. Food could be pernicious not only if it was, quote, of the wrong quality, but also if it was taken in excess or consumed too late in the day which was certain to trigger an attack. Although the causes of asthma were inevitably elusive for, for the physician, Salter did stress that asthmatics tended to be dyspeptic. They were liable to have irritable stomachs and were accustomed to restricting their diet in order to obtain relief. It was highly unlikely, according to Salter, to find an asthmatic, quote, with a perfectly st sound, strong stomach about which he has never had to think. With respect to the quality of foods, Salter's own attacks were especially triggered by, quote, foods in any way preserved, such as potted meats, dried tongues, sausages, stuffing and seasoning, preserved ginger, candied orange peel, dried figs, raisins, especially almonds and raisins, a vicious combination. Cheese, nuts, meat pies, coffee and malt liquors were also branded as extremely asthmatic. One of Salter's patients claimed that there was, quote, as much asthma in a mouthful of decayed Stilton as in a whole dinner. Another asserted that his asthma was completely dependent upon whether or not he indulged in, quote, the customary postprandial cup of coffee. Instead of eating such unwholesome victuals, food ought to be plain and well cooked, but also relatively various. An overly rigid, repetitious, and tedious diet could actually impede proper digestion resulting in more attacks. Since Salter recommended that asthmatics eat only twice a day, diets also had to be as nutritious as possible. These general rules, however, could be undermined by the, quote, strongly marked idiosyncrasies in individual cases. While the drinking of Rhine and Bordeaux wines would unquestionably bring out an attack in some of Salter's patients, others reacted only to sherry and port. So moving to the final uh, category of disease, 
As with migraine and asthma, dermatological complaints were attributed to a wide range of factors during the 19th century, including diet. And William Tilbury Fox's 1877 Atlas of Skin Diseases, for instance, urticaria, nettle, rash, or hives, uh, was blamed on, quote, mental emotion, nervous debility, especially from overwork and mental strain, exposure to great alternations of temperature, the circulation of acrid substances such as uric acid and its allies, and gouty and rheumatic subjects and in dyspeptics, or the bile acids in the blood current, the action upon the skin of external irritants such as pediculi, lice, reflected, ref, reflexed irritation from sexual disorder, looking in that direction, bad feeding, and living in damp tenements. With respect to diet, Fox stated that shellfish, pork, fruit, mushrooms, and coffee were the most common triggers of urticaria. Scottish medical professor, professor McCall Anderson similarly believed that many of these foods could cause nettle rash and added nuts, onions, garlic, wheat, cocoa, pork, and sausages to the mix. Furthermore, a medical friend of Anderson's claimed that hawthorns, raisins, prunes, figs, dates, grapes, peas, beans, oily pastries, and tea were the cause of his nettle rash. For this sufferer, the only treatment was a brandy or whiskey. Lucky man. Indeed, I can eat most of the above-mentioned articles if I am drinking whiskey toddy at the time. A relative of Anderson's also wrote to him, describing how if he consumed, quote, butcher's meat, he would develop a lump in his stomach, followed by nettle rash on my wrists, my arms, my groins, and other tender parts of the skin. Soon the inside of his throat and nose would swell, his voice would go coarse, and he would get stuffed up as if suffering from a cold. Although other people in the family similarly suffered from nettle rash, they reacted to different foods, including barley meal and oatmeal. In a whimsical conclusion to his missive, Anderson's relative suggested that his idiosyncrasy to meat could have a unique scientific function. If you made it worth my while, I will come down at the Whitsuntide holiday and be exhibited. I will also eat the Ornithocorhynchus, Paradoxus, the Platicus, and finally determine whether it be bird or beast. In other words, if you reacted to it, it was a beast. If you didn't, it was a bird. The faith of Anderson's relative in the unfailing nature of his idiosyncrasy re represents one end of a spectrum by which the relationship between diet and skin disease could be interpreted. For Anderson, diet was such an important cause of nettle rash that determining the articles at fault through empirical investigation and cooperation with the patient was the first step of treatment. Such an approach, however, was not accepted by all physicians, and many questioned the link between skin conditions and dietary idiosyncrasy. There were a number, number of reasons for such hesitation. Dermatological conditions, as with asthma and migraine, were difficult to treat and explain. Many of them, particularly eczema, were, light, were also liable to affect children and infants disproportionately, meaning that there were implications for infant feeding and nutrition. Divisive subjects in their own right. Dermatologists also were also keen to treat eczema with topical medications rather than trying to determine dietary causes, foreshadowing heated debates between the members of their profession and allergists during the 20th century. But most importantly, dietary theories of skin conditions were popular with the lay public, and this made many physicians skeptical. As London physician uh, or as a London physician and lecturer stated in an 1896 speech to the Reading Path Pathological Society about dermatology, quote, there's probably no subject in which more deep, deeply rooted convictions have been held, not only in the profession, but by the laity, than the connection between diet and disease, both as regards the causation and treatment of the latter, and the subject possesses a peculiar fascination for the lay mind. At, some, at the same time, probably no subject better illustrates the fallacies of re reasoning, the binding influence of authority, and the bias of education. In the study of diseases of the skin, we have admirable examples of the faulty conclusions that have been drawn and unrivaled opportunities of correcting them by careful observation and unfettered judgment. For this uh, speaker, such mi misconceptions were most pronounced in the study of infantile eczema, which was, quote, constantly, in which, um, 
We constantly find ascribed to faults in diet, too early or excessive use of starchy food, the premature use of meat or gravy, insufficient or deteriorated quality of the mother's milk, the use of preserved milk. All these no doubt bring evils on their own, but there is no evidence to connect them with eczema as cause and effect. The inevitable result of blaming foods, according to him, was not an improvement of symptoms, but rather the inexorable restriction of the patient's diet. Again, a theme that comes up in the 20th century. Others physician, other phys physicians concurred, not only blaming popular ideas about dermatology and diet, but also in, indicting the untested views of physicians. For example, Walter Smith, a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians of Ireland, asked, have we any certain or scientific knowledge of the influence of diet in the causation of diseases of the skin? The belief in the potency of this influence is universal with the laity and widely acknowledged by the profession generally. But the practice of physicians is partly traditional and is, unfortunately, not always based on real conviction or sound knowledge. And many circumstances conspire to tempt them to give formal advice which rests on a slender foundation. Although Scottish physician Alan Jamieson uh, allowed that certain foods could cause skin conditions, he was also hesitant to give his views, give the views of his patients much credence. We must reject in large measure the statements volunteered by our patients, though we thereby get much information. The former are vitiated by pre preconceived impressions or are based on ill-founded deductions. The latter are necessarily imperfect. The patient in nearly all cases ascribes an immediate effect to his diet, though it may be obvious on the least reflection that the action, if exerted at all, must be remote. In the discussion that followed Jameson's article, the division between physicians with respect to dermatological conditions and dietary idiosyncrasies were, was made abundantly clear. While half of the discussions agreed with Jameson that very few d skin diseases could be attributed to diet, others vehemently disagreed. A Dr. Morgan Dockerell, for instance, stated the views of Jameson and Smith were absurd, arguing that diet was central to many cutaneous diseases. The discussants were also divided on the, on the subject of whether to trust their patients' opinions when it came to diet and skin problems. Dr. Radcliffe Crocker warned that it would, quote, it was, it was not wise to go in the face of the prejudices of patients in the matter of diet. McCall Anderson disagreed. For his part, Liverpool physician Stoppard Taylor was, quote, astonished at the extraordinary differences of opinion that existed. Now, the astonishment expressed by Stoppard Taylor is, it, is in itself surprising not so much because of the debates about food allergy that would follow, but because, as I've suggested, physicians found strange reactions to food bemusing, difficult to explain, and a cause for disagreement long before the birth of allergy in 1906. Equally, many of the issues surrounding food allergy that would divide 20th century physicians were present in discussions of diet and unexplained symptoms centuries before. How were physicians to balance their patients' individual differences for example, their humoral, constitutional, or idiosyncratic predispositions with general dietary rules for health. To what extent should a physician's own experience of suffering from and trying to treat chronic, chronic symptoms, such as Father Gills and Salter's battles with migraine or asthma, influence their ideas about such phenomena? Similarly, when did the accumulated weight of anecdotal evidence begin to outweigh accepted theories about what caused certain symptoms. Finally, how should physicians view popular and indeed their patients' views and opinions with respect to the relationship between diet and chronic conditions? Were lay ideas about diet and disease enlightening or merely distracting? As the prehistory of food allergy indicates, pre-20th century physicians struggled with these issues just as their successors would in the 20th century. When terms such as allergy and anaphylaxis were being coined, those who began exploring such phenomena were not offering off a blank slate. Both physicians and their patients, not to mention the general public, had a whole host of opinions about the relationship between diet and health, and particularly chronic symptoms that resisted explanation or effective treatment.
The definitions, theories, politics, and, eco and economies of allergy during the 20th century might well have completely transformed the way in which bizarre reactions to food were under understood when compared to previous centuries, but many of the core issues that would shape the debates remained. Thanks. Thank you for listening to our History of Medicine lecture series, Case Notes. This podcast has been brought to you by the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh. We're a charity, and if you enjoyed today's show, head over to rcpe.ac.uk heritage for more information and how to donate. Thank you.